Yeah, and our next speaker, I guess, is not Levanyuk, right? How do you? No, uh, it's Birch. It's Birch. 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 Okay. Yeah. And you'll talk on the elastic instability and clamp crystalline structures mm -hmm. undergoing symmetry changing structural phase transitions. I'll give you uh, a, a warning after 15 minutes. You'll 15 minutes, true. Okay. Well, I'll be done by 15 minutes. And so, um, well, good morning, everybody. And um, I'd like to thank the organizers. Uh, we were, I think, a late submitter uh, for this uh, uh, workshop, but still, uh, I'm very honored and lucky that we are able to now present uh, some of our findings. So uh, my name is Burch, uh, so I'm one of the authors of this work. And uh, so w w I work with uh, Professor Levanyuk and uh, Professor Minyukov uh, from University of Washington and Russian Academy of Sciences. And uh, so we added Barish Okatan, who was actually working as a postdoc with me at Sabanj University, and he did uh, some extensive contribution during the preparation of the content of this talk. And one thing that I should probably say here, uh, when we submitted the abstract, we were actually working on the two-dimensional problem. Uh, and the question was, so let me probably uh, start moving forward, okay. Um, the question was about this uh, phase coexistence in uh, ferroelectric films. And we had a discussion on what is, you know, weak first order transition, what is strong first order transition. And um, there were, uh, Professor Levanyuk had some uh, hesitation about uh, some of the assumptions uh, that were uh, this fa famous paper of uh, Patsev and the older uh, paper of Devonshire that the phase transition in a uh, ferroelectric of perovskite type, uh, the most famous one, for instance, being uh, barium titanate, converts to second order. Uh, and within the context of the lambda uh, potential, if you write it for uh, barium titanate, that this fourth power term actually becomes. Uh, strongly positive due to modification by strain, and that it's going to turn into uh, a second order transition when uh, clamped on a uh, substrate. Uh, and the other thing is, so that's the assumption, of, uh, you know, if it stayed homogeneous. And uh, the other thing is, I mean, how do we define a strong first order transition, that the transition would remain first order even, you know, if it's clamped which actually leads to the formation of these you know, multi um, multiple states. So, so this was the question. Is this assumption correct that the weak first order ferroelectric transition, which is close to the tricritical point, would still remain so under clamping? And um, so the first, uh, you know, strong first order states form two phase states. Uh, you, you can look at the po uh, paper of uh, Reutbert in the 70s. And if you ask the same question for the weak uh, first order uh, transitions, um, which means it's close to tricritical point, which is, you know, you're right at the boundary of a first order and second order transition. Well, one thing is that the bulk elastic modulus depends strongly on temperature. So if, uh, if you want to, for instance, in the paper of uh, Reutbert, uh, the two phase states, are considered with their, you know, um, with their uh, associated elastic constants. However, if you are near the transition, you have a very strong dependence on temperature as well as strain. And uh, so, well, uh, if you use this Landau-like uh, approach, which is uh, base, uh, based on the Landau theory, you can actually account for such dramatic changes in the elastic modulus of the uh, system uh, near the transition and see if a homogeneous state is more profitable uh, at the transition or an inhomogeneous state is more uh, profitable. So this is actually the question that we were trying to answer. So just the schematic, you know, in the free state, okay, 
in the free state, uh, you can have a high symmetry state and you know, you, you high symmetry phase, you go to the low symmetry phase with some strain and maybe volume change. And if you are clamped like this, well, uh, okay, I pressed the wrong button. Anyways, so you can have this phase coexistence and uh, apparently this can persist for quite a bit of temperature interval. And if you are on a substrate, uh, well, this is what happens. So you have the high symmetry phase about the transition temperature on the substrate, and when you transform, uh, you want to transform to the low symmetry phase. So this whole structure, rather than homogeneously transforming to the single phase state, will actually have such a periodic structure. Uh, so this is, uh, well, this is an alternative scenario to what has been uh, assumed uh, in the previous works that this uh, transition is second order and homogeneous. Um, so, uh, well, if we went back to literature, you know, we found some uh, papers who seriously attacked this problem of phase coexistence, and one of them was this uh, paper of Onike and Minami in 2007. And uh, so they were able to predict the two phase state uh, by fixing the system volume. They, I think, assumed that. Um, infinite system, and uh, well, one th thing that they uh, neglected was that you know when you form a two-phase system, you have the you, you pay for the boundary energies. So that was one thing that they neglected. And then there's this uh, relatively more recent work of you know Selev and Lukianchuk in 2010, where they worked on vanadium oxide. Uh, and they tried to address this uh, presence of the two phase states in vanadium oxide. Uh, their analysis was in one dimension. Uh, and th well, these two papers are our papers, and these papers are actually the starting point where, uh, before considering two phase states, if you just you know, take the Landau potential and take the first derivative of this potential with respect to strain, you find stress on the system. And if you take the, again, the uh, derivative of uh, stress with respect to strain, then you start you know, getting the elastic constants. And um, we did this in 2016, and we found that um, the, at least one elastic constant, and it was the isotropic case, uh, just for the sake of simplicity, um, at least one elastic constant will go to negative values before you reach the phase transition which means uh, you have elastic instability. So this is an impossible situation. You cannot have an elastic constant um, becoming negative uh, in a structure. And then we went on to analyze this for the two-dimensional case uh, where we did some numerical work and, try, uh, and saw that inhomogeneous states are indeed appearing. But one thing that uh, we could not analyze in the 2D case was, uh, you know, how does this thermodynamic transition proceed? So for the thermodynamic transition, so you need to compare the energies of different states. I mean, if you're going to have a homogeneous single phase state, you need to find the energy of the state, which is actually quite straightforward. Uh, and if you are interested in the possibility of a two phase state, then you have to again compute ex um, exactly the energy of this two phase state and then compare their energies in uh, the temperature range of uh, interest. So, uh, well, it turned out that even for 2D, the exact, you know, time, uh, the, the analytical thermodynamic analysis was quite uh, lab laborious. Uh, that's, uh, that's what uh, Professor Levanyuk said. So we went on to the 1D case, so one-dimensional system. Uh, simple, but uh, we did uh, get uh, quite a bit, uh, we, we were able to actually learn quite a bit about the physics or what was going on. So first of all, uh, one difficulty in the previous situation was the you know, consideration of the, um, the interface boundary energies, which was relatively easy in the 1D case, uh, while well, still uh, required some uh, laborious uh, algebra. And... Um, so uh, the, here, what we tried to do was we clamped the system in 1D, 
And uh, so we just uh, check the, uh, also the limit of stability of the homogeneous uh, non-symmetrical phase for these systems. So the, um, we start with this uh, uh, lambda uh, energy with the gradient term. So we have this elastic effect here, Q is the longitudinal elastic modulus. We have this coupling of the strains to the order parameter eta. Eta is just some order parameter, electrically neutral, so we are not uh, interested in any um, electrical effects, uh, but just elastic effects. And we pick this beta to be zero to actually bring the system to the uh, tri-critical um, uh, tri uh, transition. And... Uh, where we have, by the way, the absolute instability of the, uh, the homogeneous state widest here, uh, homogeneous state, homogeneous low symmetry state, where eta is non-zero. So we minimize this uh, and solve it uh, with respect to eta, and the strains can actually be written in terms of the displacements. So we have these uh, equations of minimization. We have this uh, stress equation, which is just 1D. And we have the equation of state for eta. Uh, we uh, introduce the uh, boundary conditions for displacement at one end and the other end. And these are the uh, boundary conditions for the order parameter at, again, uh, the one end and the other end of this one-dimensional system. Uh, we carry out some uh, further algebra. I don't want to really uh, bore you with this. By the way, there's a paper. That we, that's in progress where we will give the details of these calculations. And uh, so one thing that we needed to do was, I mean, we obtained this equation whose solution was provided by uh, Falk in 1984. And what we did was we actually, uh, if you take the system, the one end of the system to start at zero and the other end being say at Z, Z being equal to L, so such a profile of the ordered parameter actually satisfied that equation, an inhomogeneous profile. And we took that as, uh, we fed that into the equation to in fact compute the energy of this two-phase state uh, and compare it with the energy of the homogeneous state. So we assume a virtual homogeneous state and then we also go and compute the inhomogeneous uh, two-phase state and just, you know, compare their energies as a function of temperature. Um, and, well, from the equivalences of the energies at the higher temperature, which is when you switch to the entirely high symmetric phase, and then there's also a lower limit, and the lower limit is defined by the disappearance of the two-phase state where the single homogeneous low symmetry phase is ultimately stable. Uh, so we have these two boundaries. So we were able to find those temperatures. Uh, so this is the temperature for what we call the upper limit. So beyond this temperature, your two-phase state will disappear and you're in the high symmetry phase or the para phase. And, um, and we also tried to find this, uh, this parameter here, which is the eta square averaged over the sample, which uh, gives you an idea about the fraction of the, uh, this low symmetry phase when you transform into the two-phase state from the uh, high symmetry state. So when you're cooling the high symmetry uh, state. Um, and this is the lower limit, again, found from the equivalence of the energies. Uh, um, and th well, this is uh, another additional analysis. So these things were not in the abstract book. What happened was when we submitted this um, abstract, we were the, this one-dimensional analysis was still underway. And then I was going to talk about something else, but then once we started getting some nice results for the one-dimensional case, then we decided to actually include these analysis. And this is just a stability analysis. Uh, what's the stability analysis? So you, you're actually checking the overheating limit of the, uh, uh, of the, if you're coming from below, which is from low temperatures, for instance, you can check the overheating limit of the homogeneous low symmetry state 
what you do is you have a homogeneous state with some well-defined eta. So you introduce some small, um, some small cosine like uh, perturbation, which is eta prime. And now you try to find out if your, state, um, uh, if your system will stay stable against this perturbation. And if it cannot stay stable, well, that's your overheating limit definition. Uh, so I will, uh, and we also found the temperatures for the, the, these uh, stability limit curves. I hope I'll be able to show you. Uh, now, uh, everything I discussed until now is just theory and was handled analytically. What we did later on was we solved the same equations, which is the equation of state and the stress equation, numerically. The problem was the analytical solution required certain approximations. And while finding out that these approximations are well valid for large systems, for long, uh, large L, the lower L cases, uh, there was a lot of suspicion that the results wouldn't hold, and people are very interested in these size effects. You know, when you have a small L, how the system, you know, transforms, or are two f uh, is the two-phase state stable or not? So uh, then we decided to also carry out a numerical solution of the same problem, and uh, well, maybe I should come to this later. Uh, because I will uh, mention a little uh, glitch that we had in the numerical analysis. So uh, the, uh, now we are giving here the comparison between the analytical result of the upper limit. So how to read this? This is, this is a phase diagram. It's temperature versus uh, the system size for a one-dimensional system. So when you are here, you are in the high symmetry phase. If you, if you cool it down, you hit this uh, upper boundary, you enter, so the, the, between these dashed curves, you're in the high, uh, in the two-phase state. And, uh, well, this region is where the single homogeneous phase is ultimately unstable. So uh, thermodynamically, uh, in between these two dashed lines, you expect to be in the high symmetry state. If your L is really low, well, we have these data points here. So these data points are the numerical analysis. So if this is the analytical curve, uh, and if these are numerical uh, dots, well, so we still see that the theory captures what might happen for small l. And somewhere here, you have this straight line, which means that if you come from the high symmetry state, then you directly enter the uh, homogeneous low symmetry state. So we have a big interval where one would expect for a system under clamping to have a, um, the two-phase state existence. And this is what uh, I mentioned here as a parameter, which is eta square versus length. So this is kind of like giving you the fraction of the low symmetry phase as a function of L right at the uh, transition. Uh, so this equation five, it's actually going to be in the paper. Uh, so I hope uh, that we will send the paper out soon. It's under progress. Um, one thing that uh, I should probably mention, we have this zoom into this area, and the reason is because, so this is that part of the curve where you transmit from high symmetry to uh, homogeneous low symmetry phase, and this is just uh, a stability boundary. It, it just turns out that uh, they coincide, and this is kind of like, uh, again, um, under this, the single homogeneous phase is ultimately unstable. So, uh, well, we were able to also discover some uh, metastable states in between, but we don't mention that that's actually a glitch of the numerics, uh, because with numerics, we were uh, sometimes getting these type of uh, multi... So this is the equilibrium. We were lucky to get under 25. If you go beyond that, we start getting such solutions, which are metastable states, and they correspond to... Um, some uh, dots here. Well, this is for the low uh, temperature limit. Uh, so I, well, uh, they are not clear here. But multiple interfaces still gives you uh, a solution, but they are metastable with respect to the uh, single uh, phase state. So, uh, well, uh, these are the conclusions. So in, in 1D, it's possible to show that the phase coexistence can um, exist. Uh, one question we had was, is this 
can this be extended to 2D? Well, yes, in 2D from the numerical analysis, we saw that the two-phase states um, can exist. And um, so as you are uh, approaching small l, which is co uh, close to your uh, correlation radius, um, we, uh, the, the width of the two-phase region decreases. And the gradient energy is extremely important. The entire that shape of the curve is dictated by the, in fact, the gradient energy itself. And um, so uh, probably, well, there's still more to do. Uh, we, we would like to you know, extend this phase diagram uh, perhaps to 2D as a function of, uh, for instance, field nictus, which is a more realistic parameter for experiments. And probably I'm uh, just about uh, at the boundary of my uh, time limit. So thank you very much for your attention. Questions? So at the risk of making a fool of myself, uh, your boundary conditions for the derivative of the order parameter, uh, why do they have to be zero at the Well, zero, so when we uh, define the boundary, the, the gradient of the boundary, uh, uh, excuse me, the gradient of the order, the order parameter, parameter being yes. zero. So it's just to, kind of eliminate the effect of boundaries and just make them neutral with respect to the in what happens in the interior. Yes. Uh, because if we pick, uh, for instance, some decaying eta at the boundary specified by what they call this extrapolation length, uh, then it starts to have an influence on the phase transition characteristics of the system. So we want to eliminate that and focus solely on uh, what's happening. Uh, but in a realistic situation, this doesn't need to be true, right? Yeah, in, of course, in real so life, certainly. Okay. In real life, uh, uh, the, uh, it's probably very rare that, I mean, for instance, your ferroelectric polarization just terminates without any decay at the interface. Yeah, it's just to hypothetically eliminate the interface effects. Well, thanks for the uh, interesting talk. I, I just, uh, as I mentioned during the break, we yeah. have two publications actually in uh, Physical Review B and, and Active Material, yeah. uh, exactly on this topic of string phase separation, actually. You can actually define almost like a compositional yeah. phase separation and phase diagram. You have the Gibbs phase rules, you can have the string spinado and, and coherent, yeah. incoherent, uh, because you yeah, are talking about here, is a f a more general case is not fixed volume, or of course fixed strain. So you can have a strain phase separation. And I just want to, make, we even have a, a, a computed actual phase diagrams for like lead titanate. Yeah. Uh, you can actually also have like eutectic like diagrams also. Like uh, phase separation. Yes, and then we use phase few simulations to compare mm -hmm. with the analytical phase diagrams and how, how the coherency mm -hmm. string energy will shrink the miscibility gaps also. Yeah, I mean, I will, um, as I said, you know, I'll certainly uh, read these papers in more detail because now that you mentioned, now I'm actually uh, more, um, I would say, informed about the uh, you know, content that you can actually use strain like a um, composition axis and just you know have these you know uh, curves similar to this free energy of mixing. Uh -huh. All right. If there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again.